that's that's who I was. You know, I I spent just about twenty years with with PTSD, and then it was gone in two hours. And I was like, it's absolutely criminal that nobody told me that. I asked for help so many times. Mm. I went to so many different people, and nobody mentioned it. No one. So it's one of the bees in my bonnet, as you can tell. And it's one of the <laughs> things that I'm really passionate about people knowing is that you can totally mm -hmm. get over it. You can have like amazing friendships, amazing relationships of, of any variety that you want. And uh, it can be kind of relatively easy, if not weird and new, but still, you know, good and positive and your life can be full and you never have to be that lonely, emotionally isolated kid or young yeah. person ever, ever again if you don't want to. Yeah. What's up, you beautiful beasts? I'm Katie. I'm on a mission to help humans become the best possible versions of themselves and to strive for overall health, mental health, emotional health, physical health, all of the healths without ever having to step on a scale. I have had the privilege to talk to all kinds of different humans who've been through a plethora of experiences just being a human and existing. I believe that every single time somebody shares their story, at least one person listening will learn from it, be inspired by it, and maybe, just maybe, even change the entire direction of their life. These are the stories of humans unveiling their beautiful beast. Keep listening. This is the Unveiling the Beast podcast. <laughs> So um, for the listeners, we met on a, um, a Facebook, Facebook group, group yeah. and I started following them me immediately and they have the same kind of humor I do. We'll just leave that. <laughs> and um, it's raunchy and it's, um, well, is raunchy the good word or? Naughty. <laughs> Naughty. <laughs> um. I like Very childish. shock value, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's so You've funny. got to balance it out. I do so much trauma work and, you know, the, the, we, we have light moments in there as well. But I think, yeah. you know, it's good to be a well-rounded a well -rounded individual. And for me, that includes being very childish and laughing at very silly things. Yes, it is definitely healing for me. Um, Even the raunchy shit, so... <laughs> <laughs> So can you tell the listener a little bit about who you are and why you are who you are? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm non-binary. I go by they, them. Uh, it's not a political statement. It was a surprise to me as much as it was to anyone else. Um, and I, I'm in the UK. You might be able to tell from my accent. I'm the oldest of, of three kids. Um, and I've been published a couple of times I co-authored a couple of books and in 2023 I founded the Center for Childhood Trauma Healing specializing in relational uh, complex PTSD treatment mm. and we're talking about the permanent stuff um I lived with regular PTSD for nearly 20 years and after searching and searching and searching until I thought my head was going to fall off, I found somebody who was like, do you just want to get rid of it? And I was like, obviously. Um, so I had that treated in two hours. And then I felt like I got my life back. It was amazing. I, I was like, my, I was so much lighter. I felt so much better. And I, the next year I retrained I didn't know what I was going to specialize in, but I, I retrained in uh, neuro linguistic programming, which I can explain a bit more in a while, and timeline therapy, and sold all of my stuff, went traveling, which I never thought I would do. I'm autistic and ADHD, and anything outside of my usual uh, routine I find quite challenging, even if I want to mm. do it. And at the end of my travels, it had all gone really well. I had so many adventures, and then at the end of my travels, I, I had a little breakdown. So I ended up having to come home and got back in contact with my trauma practitioner and went back in and she was like, she was, she said, you, you've got complex PTSD as a result of your upbringing. And I was like, oh, wow. And, um, you know, my family are very close. We see each other a lot. We have a lot of fun. So it wasn't the sort of textbook stuff that you imagine with, with complex PTSD. 
and obviously since going through my own process and you know I've been um very much a a student of sort of psychology and um healthy relationships and stuff for like 10 years and so after everything I've learned I was like oh wow and um I worked in healthcare for a little bit uh just after the pandemic I got I got a job uh in healthcare for just over a year as a general health and well-being coach mm. And the majority of the problems that people were coming to me for, although on paper it was things like diabetes, relationship with food, anxiety and depression, all these different things, the underlying thing for almost every single patient that I worked with was childhood trauma. And I was like, yeah, this is it. This is this is yeah. the thing that I can't put down. I'm annoying everyone with talking about it so much. <laughs> and, yeah, so that's... That's why I opened the, the centre. It's online, so I work with people sort of all over. And uh, now doing this really magical work and helping people who actually are ready for a solution and who want to get over it and get past it and live their life, uh, having got rid of at least some of their trauma, if not all of it, depending on yeah. where they are and, and how long they work with me for. So, yeah. yeah. So do, do people come to you or... Um... Yeah, I guess I was asking that because a lot of the times, like the people I work with don't even realize that some of their adult behaviors come from childhood trauma that's been buried and they don't even remember that exists. Mm. So um, do you get a lot of people who didn't even realize that that's where it came from? I think a lot of the people who arrive at, at sort of at my sort of metaphorical door have already worked that out I think that mm. the first time that you realize that and you need to share that and, and have your story witnessed I, I you know I consider that a very sacred part of the process I think you want to do that with like a you know trauma-informed therapist and someone who's going to sit with you for a long time uh, yeah. my work is a bit more solutions orientated so if you've only just realized and then you come to someone like me who's like it'll be gone in you know 90 days or six months they might not be ready for that yet. I think that there is a, a a long process, I guess. And I'm the person they come to once they're ready to clear it out and be done with it. And mm. I think for some folks, that stuff, they're not, they're not ready to do that yet. Um, they're still working it out. And also I think it takes stability. It's very difficult to process trauma if your current life is not very stable, if you're worried about money coming in, you, your body needs to be as regulated as possible to do this kind of yeah. work because it's it's it can be potentially relatively quick process mm -hmm. but it's very difficult to access those deep parts if you don't feel regulated in your own life yeah yeah and that that's part of the the whole nlp training right and that's a lot of my training is nlp also and mm -hmm. the the whole idea behind that for listeners who don't kind of don't know what that is, is like you're changing your neurology, you're changing the way you relate to the memories rather than, because you can't change the memory, but you can change how you relate to it. Um, is that making sense? <laughs> yeah, kind, kind of. of. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to the trauma work, you might, you can't change the memory in the sense that you can't deny that it happened. Right but you can continue that memory and kind of create, you know, it, it, it in your sort of visual uh, sense in your mind's eye, you can create an ending to that. That doesn't have to be based in reality, but your brain doesn't care. It just wants relief. Yeah. And actually if we can design an, a, a kind of imaginative experience that helps you to kind of write an ending to that, then actually the body can let go the trauma can let go, the emotions can come out. And that's that's a lot of what I'm doing with with the folks that I work with. Hmm. So if you're open and willing, are you open to sharing a little bit about your own story? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, I've done this a lot. I won't okay. share any go gory details purely because I feel like the people who need to know this might not be in a place to hear everything about it. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm ha happy. I I'll give a broad picture. So... My regular PTSD, that that was the part that I was super conscious of. Even before I knew the term PTSD, I knew that when I was triggered, and again, I didn't know the word triggered, 
but I knew when it popped up, I knew exactly where that came from. And it was, it started when I was a child, we were on holiday with another family that um, I'd grown up knowing. And the grown up, the, the adult son of the husband in the other family arrived on this holiday unannounced stayed for a week maximum and disappeared after that we didn't know he was going to be there he wasn't mm -hmm. even invited we'd never met him before and one night he was left in charge of the kids while the all the parents went out to dinner and um i was sexually assaulted whilst the parents were out and at that age i didn't know what that was i didn't even know really you know what consent was or anything else and I, I had no idea what this was it was just a weird mm. thing that happened and there was no kind of like uh, regular kind of violence you know so it was just yeah. really strange and I didn't know what to make of it and I just didn't mention it to anybody I think I was just so and I think a lot of my memory just never was I I even you know even when I was going through my my um healing process I didn't remember much about it mm. and I think even the morning after when I, I remember getting out of bed and and you know had a few uh kind of physical symptoms to deal with and even then I, I remember thinking about it and just just standing there and just being really confused like I, I have no idea what this means or what the you know what that was that happened and I just was like, well, I, even if I wanted to tell somebody, I don't even know what I would say. I don't even know what those words are. Yeah. So I think when I got to secondary school, here we start secondary school the year that you turn 12, at least in the South. I think they do it differently up North. But um, And, you know, being in a bigger school with more kids and more kind of mature conversations happening, I started to hear more about sexual assault and um, the R word around that. And I was like, ha, huh, I think that's what happened to me. But I wasn't sure. Like at that point, it was just like such a abstract concept. It was just strange. And then when I was um, 14, I met a friend and she had been through something similar, although I guess, comparatively a lot worse than me mm. and she she I think because she'd had a lot of support from from young around that she had a lot of the vocabulary and concepts and she was a lot more kind of informed and so we we talked a lot about that and I started to understand it a lot more and then I was in my first long-term relationship I'm in my later teens for three years and during that time I was very triggered that partner was a very unsafe person, um, you know, as an armchair enthusiast, he was, he was probably a, a narcissistic sociopath or something like that. Not, not that we use those terms so much nowadays, but, uh, you know, he was very abusive, bad news and, and, um, it was, it was nightmare fuel. And during that time he, he triggered this trauma uh, he he was my my second abuser in, in this you know in the same context as well, and it was actually because of that that I ended up telling my mum what had happened all those years before, and uh, she told my dad, and it took him three days, and on that third day he spent the whole day at the pub before he could come home and actually bring it up with me, and he cried through the whole thing, and I felt very guilty. Mm. that I, I had made him cry. Obviously, I don't. I understand that's not what happened. Right. But at the time, I felt very, very guilty. And, uh, yeah, so I think once my parents had been told, there was a big release. I think I cried almost daily for about three months. So a lot of it came out, but I was still traumatised. But I think a lot, a lot of that stuff that I was holding in did come out. And then in my 20s, it happened again. I went on a first date with somebody I knew. Uh, he was uh, he lived with some of my friends. I'd met him several times before. And he was supposed to, like, normally I would, I would take my own car to first dates, you know. I hadn't drank any alcohol. Um, and he was on his way to taking me back home, to driving me home. He just changed his mind and took me to a hotel and I you know, 
the worst happened and the and I remember just in that moment I was like I just want to be alive so the following morning I got dropped off home and as my foot like was on the gravel of our driveway I remember just thinking I'm alive I made it mm. and that was a like you know touch wood that was the last time it ever happened um and it took me days to come to terms with the fact that it, ha it had in fact happened again um and it was only two years later that I found my practitioner and we worked, we did a bit of work together. And then towards the end of that, that sort of general therapy, we then processed that trauma and it was gone in two hours and it's never come back. I don't get flashbacks. Talking about it is not, not particularly hard. I mean, it's not, it's not a cheerful uh, subject, but right. I don't, it's not, it's, it really has gone. Uh, when this has come up with other people and in my own work, when when it comes up, um, it really feels that it's very clear that those my my clients are talking about their story and it's got nothing to do with me. And um, you know, when it comes up on TV or in news headlines and stuff, I'm not not triggered, and I used to be horribly triggered around that. So that was the regular PTSD. And then when I went back and, and, and had this treatment for my complex PTSD, I, during that time, I listened to, um, I can only listen to audiobooks because I have the attention span of a, a very damaged goldfish. So, <laughs> um, so I listen, I listen, I have to listen to all of mine on audiobooks whilst I'm driving or doing something else to occupy my monkey brain. And, uh, so during, that treatment for the, for the complex PTSD, which was a lot to do with my family, lots and lots of trauma in my family. Um, my grandfather on my dad's side, he was in the Second World War as a young man. I think he was 16 when the Second World War started. And then he kind mm. of, I think he ended up uh, in the Sahara Desert for some of it. But we we don't know a huge amount about what happened for him then. Um, and then, you know, on my mum's side, there's... Um, a lot of other stuff like my my grandmother came over from india in 1949 after the partition of india and pakistan um and then i think you know there's a lot of brown women on my mum's side and then the sort of weird sort of love slash racism that they experienced a lot in this country and then particularly with partners and stuff it was just mm -hmm. that there, there was just a huge amount of stuff there and um yeah, so I think a lot of people think about complex PTSD and they think about, you know, the stuff we might see on TV for like those charities, like, you know, for kids and stuff. And we think about kids who are starved or left alone or, um, you know, all, all of those really textbook stuff. And of course, that's totally valid. But actually, for the majority of people that I know, including myself and the people that I, I treat, um that's not their story a lot of their story is about you know parents who don't like big emotions um parents who had other priorities which could have been alcohol or going out or um expecting their children to perform academically at, at, at any cost yeah um parents who were just repeatedly said really unkind things to their kids it's it's way more subtle and i think when each each of those incidents that create that make up complex ptsd each in incident on its own most of the time is a bit weird or a bit off or not very nice but it's when we put all of those thousands of interactions together that's where we get complex ptsd mm. and and the difference is is that complex ptsd is a feeling and it's a reaction and it's a behavior but it's not clearly a a memory in the same way that ptsd is simple ptsd you know with simple ptsd you can say well i was in that car crash or i was attacked by that person or yeah um you know like i, I was in the school when the shooter turned up or whatever um simple ptsd is really much easier to be able to identify but the complex stuff is much much more difficult and 
the majority of I, I think a huge a vast majority of adults have complex PTSD mm. in my that's my guess just because of of what I see and even in people who've never shared their story with me you know I see how there are some people who are perpetually single not because they're not interested but because of their beliefs about relationships because of everything that they've seen and been through yeah or it might be that anytime someone wants to offer uh you know when when you're in a healthy relationship if something comes up it's it's healthy to to bring it up with that other person and to be like hey when we were having this conversation the other day you know i think i was kind of looking for us to kind of connect over this but you kicked off you were uncomfortable you didn't like it and you lashed out and you said some things that weren't very nice like what was going on for you you know so there are a lot of adults who unintentionally uh sabotage or 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 struggle to maintain their general relationships you know friendships family or whatever because of for, for reasons that they can't put into words and you know emotional immaturity is another really big one i think you can have a parent who is you know doesn't have a personality disorder and was there for you but if they're emotionally immature that's that's enough to create complex ptsd yeah um so it it's much more it's much more nebulous and and much more abstract and most of us will never be diagnosed with complex ptsd firstly because it doesn't exist as a as a diagnosis yet officially but also because for so many of us we either don't have access to medical care that would even give us that information or even if we do have access to medical care it's often not up to date enough because medical care that world will frequently not not dare to acknowledge a thing until they've got loads of studies and it's in the DSM-5, the, the mm-hmm. diagnostics manual that we use for sort of neurological uh, and um, mental health issues and stuff like that. Um, so actually, for the majority of folks who have complex PTSD, they're not going to end up getting permanent good solutions for that by going the medical route because it's so... It's not the infrastructure just isn't there yet for most of us. Yeah. I'm actually learning quite a bit. Um, <laughs> and I'm I'm relating this to I, I know it's two different things, but um, the topic of grief, when I learned that there's macro griefs and micro griefs where the macro griefs are like you somebody died and the micro griefs are like you had a breakup and you're grieving the relationship that you made up in your head that you never had. You know, mm. so things like that. So it's not it's not the same topic, but it's the same idea where like the small things add up. Yeah. You know? So Yeah, hundred percent. So if somebody's coming to you for the first time, mm-hmm. how would you start the conversation? Does that make sense? Yeah, I generally just open the floor. I'm like how is life for you? You know, what's going mm-hmm. on? What what are you, what's good and what's what's not so good? What are you, you know, where are you in your power and where are you not? Or um, And just, just to kind of get an idea of where they are right now. And generally speaking, as people start talking about different areas of their life, it, it becomes, you know, I think you've probably done the same in, in the NLP. You really learn to watch people's faces and watch their body language and Mm -hmm. watch if their face starts changing shape, even like the the tiniest bit or watch their, their color change or, you know, their access to words might be interrupted as the feeling comes up or, you know, so I guess I'm just kind of what listening to what they're saying and and just kind of watching how they're reacting to the things that they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if if they've got a joy in their life or something that's working really well, they don't even have to say it, their face will say it. And then equally when, you know, if they're talking about maybe they've got a difficult relationship with their parents or they're not having a, a great time in their love life, then a lot of that will become really apparent. Just, just, and we just kind of go from there. And 
yeah, so I guess the, the first uh, session is very much about getting a really big picture and starting to pick up on where the patterns are or where they're struggling. And I try to, you know, obviously people are only seeing me usually for an hour a week, mm. but I try to help it to become a relatively immersive experience in that I'll give them resources if if they want them and sort of um, books and, and or, or audio books or podcasts, to, depending on what they need and what they want, or even tasks to help them to, to kind of support them in the process because so much of what I teach and so much of what we're aiming for is is also available in a lot of uh, my favourite books I recommend all the time. Mm -hmm. And when you've got relational trauma, so frequently there are massive gaps in our experience in terms of our relationships with other human beings. And I think that, you know, there's four books I recommend over and over again. I've actually made it into a reading list on my website and it helps you to begin to build a framework of what healthy looks like and and your part in that and what you should probably expect from, you know, the other adults in your life. Um, so, you know, people don't get homework for the sake of it. You know, they, they don't get marked um, or scored right. or graded. Um, it's much more sort of things that are going to support them in the process. Um and, you know, if people have kind of got low level addictions like food or, or and other things, then we might introduce a practice as an example of um, I, I had one patient whilst I was in healthcare, and she said, um, I really I really want to address my relationship with food. And I was like, OK, um, and just for the record, I don't care what size anybody is and I don't you know have no I, I i'm there purely to support people to do what they want to do i have mm -hmm. no opinion no opinion otherwise i think it's important to kind of be be neutral um because i think a well person is well regulated right a well person will will manage those things it's not that they don't know it's that emotionally they're not in that space and mm -hmm. i tend to take take that um approach so I said to her, what happens before you're, you're reaching for the food? What is it that you're avoiding or what are you, what, what are you numbing out? She's like, don't know. I don't know. I was like, okay. And so I introduced the idea that right before she goes to reach for, for her comfort foods, she would just take a second, a breath, just to ask herself, what am I feeling? Mm -hmm. And she came back to the next session. She said, couldn't do it, couldn't do it. And I was like, right. I said, let's let's take it back. So for the next week, you're going to touch your own skin, doesn't matter where it is, for one minute a day. That is your one homework. And she was like, and she, you know, really didn't like her body and felt very uncomfortable. I said, it can be anything. You can hold your own hands. And she said, I could hold my own elbows or shoulders. I was like, that does, it doesn't matter. Just do that. And she came back to the third session and she said, I know why I eat. And I was like, yes. So, um there's so much around you know and and surely surely enough underneath there was was complex trauma and her her relationship with her mum who she loved very much mm -hmm. and so much of what we're dealing with is you know I, i'm sure you probably t take take the same uh, approach because i'm sure it, i'm sure it's mentioned in nlp training but whatever it is that we're doing habitually we are attempting to make ourselves more comfortable or to self-medicate or to mm -hmm. meet a need. And that's currently the only way we know how to do it, even if it's imperfect. Yeah. In my, com my coaching community, we call it symptoms work versus systems work. Mm. So the people are, are, we're constantly trying to just fix the symptoms rather than going inside ourselves and fixing like where the actual problem is. Mm. yeah yeah 100 percent. which leads me to my next question i want to hear more about um in, earlier you mentioned timeline therapy mm. and i want to hear your take on it because timeline therapy has been extremely precious in my own life um so yeah i want to hear i want to hear what you got to say about it <laughs> <laughs> 
I really loved my my training uh, of that because it kind of gave me this concept and and also you know whilst you're training you have to go through the process yourself right so this is not coming from a, I'm not a fan of the theory uh you know I also did it personally and like cried a lot during some of it and it was just this really magical experience it's like you have access to your entire life previous present and future mm mm-hmm. And actually, you that's yours and you, you can do with it what you need to do in order to feel better. Um, I, I find it a lot, and particularly actually with my, interestingly, with, with my um, male clients, is that, you know, I sort of introduce them to, to the idea and I'm like, you know, th- this is the sort of process and this is how it looks and this is what we might might do, this is what we could do. Um you know, obviously talking about traumas and, and experiences they, they've been through when they were young. And we're like, and we can end that that memory. We can write a new me- a new ending to, to that and sort of, you know, I, I, I use timeline therapy a lot, but I've kind of created, I've, I've sort of fleshed it out because I feel like the way I was taught it was maybe a bit too simple and it needs a little bit mm. more. So I also use some other other modalities with it at the same time. But interestingly, the male clients are like, well, I can't I can't do that because it's not true. Because that that little version of me, he he has to go back to that. And I'm like, to where? It's finished. It's not real. It's in the past. Mm. And they have this really, really difficult time to get their heads around the fact that actually if you want to you can write a new ending to that stuff. You know, you can process it to the point that you never need to go back there. That that younger child version of you never needs to go back. And I think once you can allow yourself to go there or you're ready to go there, I think it's like really magical. Yeah. I what like about you? <laughs> well, my particular, so my training, we we like you know we have to practice it a bunch of times with our peers and so not only am i practicing it but i'm like boom i get a timeline therapy today boom i get another one today and it always took me back to my sixth birthday party mm. so i keep a picture of that little girl the little me i keep a picture of her with me so that when i'm like talking shit to myself I look at that picture and be like, well, I wouldn't say that to her. Mm. So, you know, very precious. Because when you look at a human and like a hurting human and you realize that they're just like the hurting child version of themselves, it's so much easier to be open-minded to what they have to say. Does that make Mm. sense? Because I think there's so much conflict right now going on all over the world Mm. and when you get this kind of training you start to look at humans differently you know and it's it's a beautiful thing for me yeah definitely i i have to say i've i've looked at and I, i won't name names but there are people in my life who i have struggled very very hard to love because of everything that we've been through throughout our lives and now when there's an acting out you know obviously for for the for the most part my complex ptsd is gone even if there were requirements for that type of trauma like you know uh, traits in the dsm and stuff i wouldn't meet the requirements anymore but i used to um so generally i don't get dragged into that i i can genuinely observe it and it doesn't really bring up too much in me most of the time I might get genuinely annoyed or angry, but, mm. but you know, I can look at, at people like that from, you know, who, who I've had this long and complicated relationship with. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm watching a three-year-old. I'm watching mm. this giant three-year-old stamp their foot and be upset because actually they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and they just want everything to be okay. And actually they're scared and they're panicked. And it doesn't take away from their accountability, and and the fact that they are responsible and that they, you know, 
them being ethical is, is still something they should be concerned with mm-hmm. but it definitely makes it easier to to not take it personally and also I think there's that part of like oh my god you were really unloved as a kid like no one was there for you you don't even know how to do simple emotions and and I I didn't really either um but I think to be in this position now and to look at that you it gives you a little bit of distance and I think we need that a lot especially after I think living with with any any level of trauma, it's so confronting. It's so in your face all the time. Yeah. And to be in a space where actually you don't have, it's not in your face most of the time anymore, is just so relieving. I when I was younger and I was sort of still living with this very traumatized brain, I thought that I was like a. I thought I was one of these people who like could never sit down and. I was always on the go and I was always going out and I was never getting enough sleep and I would be going out in the evenings and getting up early for school or college or work. Like it was just unhinged, like there was so much. And then once my health <laughs> took a turn for the worse in my uh, mid mid 20s and then after that. And then you know started trauma treatment and stuff. I actually discovered that underneath all of that I'm like this Zen sloth, like outside of <laughs> when my dra- my, when my brain's not traumatized. I'm just like, yeah, whatever, man. Like, it's <laughs> and it, it's not it's not like an avoidance thing, but I just generally I'm like quite calm most of the time. Um, you know, when difficult emotions turn up, I'm fully on board with them. You know, like I didn't know that I could be this kind of like chilled out and you know re- relatively in control but also like comfortable with all of the things when I was younger like being dysregulated was a part of almost everyday life and I just didn't know how to handle anything and um you know people would sometimes have nicknames for me that would imply that I was difficult mm. when actually I was massively struggling yeah um so it's the, the the those two you know the, this chapter of my life now po- uh, post trauma compared to the me before that are like two different completely different people in some ways yeah. it's been yeah really weird but in a good way i totally relate to that i um, mean i've i've been in this work for like five ish years but i didn't start doing my own inner work until like last April and the difference between that human and me today um so many people that I've have known me for a while are like you're so calm (laughs) (laughs) there's this calm aspect Mm. um and it's not like I'm better than everyone else but I I mean a lot of it is a result of releasing emotions that I stuffed for 38 years you know that can help But just like there's just this calm. That's the only way I know how to describe it. So I relate to the, what did you call it? A Zen sloth? Yeah. (laughs) I love that. And yeah, it's it's like quite normal for me to just kind of sit and just either watch TV or just look out the window. And I'm just like, I'm just here. You Mm -hmm. know, I mean, part part of it is is ADHD dysfunction, like executive (laughs) dysfunction, because sometimes I'm like, I just don't have the dopamine to do anything right now. (laughs) But but even in that, I'm just like, it is what it is. You know, it's it's um, and I, I agree with you. It's not about being better than someone else. I think I think when you've been through this, you're like desperate for other people to know that they can have this as well. Yeah. Like we know how awful it is to to kind of be living with this traumatized brain and just trying to function like at day to day everyday things. It's so hard. Yeah. And you know, I often get cross when I hear that some people, who, you know, who don't have any kind of very complex um, mental health, you know, they 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 might have anxiety, depression, and trauma, but they don't have. Uh, um, personality disorder or dissociative identity or something we're talking about fairly regular folks who've been going to the same therapist for sort of five ten years and they're still traumatized and i'm like okay i'm like what what if you could get rid of it though and they're like well my therapist doesn't believe in that or my therapist has never mentioned that and i'm like okay 
you know, it's not my place. It's not my place to tell people that they're, they're doing their life or their healing or their mental health wrong. It's not yeah. my place to do that. But I get frustrated that I feel like all of us have, have a, we, we all play a role in each other's lives, whether that's professionally or personally. And I think being really upfront and cognizant and, and educated and aware about what we can provide and what we can't provide it is ethical and it's right. Mm. You know, if people are going through that, they're, they're just kind of coming to terms with what they went through as a, as a kid or something, and they've never said it out loud before, I would recommend that they go and speak to a, ther- a trauma informed therapist before they come to someone like me. Mm. I think it's a very important thing to for us all to be aware you know and then when you've got a therapist who they've had the same you know they are a talking therapist and that's or, or a psychotherapist or something you know surely there's there's a point where they feel that their client has reached a point where they're able to discuss their stuff they've rationalized it very well you know they're much more self-compassionate you know all of those things and then there should be a point where they go, right, it, it kind of sounds to me like you might actually be ready to actually process your trauma once and for all and get rid of it and treat it. Mm-hmm. You know, that's not that's not what talking therapy does. It doesn't claim to do that. And there's no evidence to suggest that it treats PTSD. Um, you know, have you thought about maybe moving on to the next professional or getting a second one who does that stuff? And I'll support you during during the you know whatever, yeah. But I frequently don't hear of that conversation happening, and I get frustrated because I feel like for the very people that need tra- you know effective trauma treatment and all of that stuff like they need all the encouragement and support they can to get there i think to leave somebody in a traumatized state for the rest of their lives and not even suggest it that they might be able to kind of really get rid of it or heal from it like permanently properly is um yeah i think it's wrong and that's that's who i was you know i i spent just about 20 years with with ptsd and then it was gone in two hours. And I was like, it's absolutely criminal that nobody told me that. I asked for help so many times. Mm. I went to so many different people and nobody mentioned it. No one. So it's one of the bees in my bonnet, as you can tell. And it's one <laughs> of the things that I'm really passionate about people knowing is that you can totally mm. get over it. You can have like amazing friendships, amazing relationships of, of any variety that you want. And uh, it can be kind of relatively easy, if not weird and new, but still, you know, good and positive and your life can be full and you never have to be that lonely, emotionally isolated kid or young yeah. person ever ever again if you don't want to. Yeah. I love that. I have three more questions for you. Mm-hmm. The first one is where can people find you? Uh, start on my website, which is mxharrishill.com, M-X, Harris with a double R, Hill with a double L, dot com. All of my stuff is on there. Okay, cool. My second question is, what's your favorite joke? <laughs> oh, I know so many jokes. I'm like... <laughs> Off the top person. of your head, which one's sticking out for you right now? Um <laughs> There's one that I learned recently. It's really, it's, it's, yeah. My my younger child so, like would have loved this. The <laughs> one I read recently, and I can't stop telling it to people, was a dung beetle walks into a bar and asks, "Is this stool taken?" <laughs> <laughs> <It's> so stupid. <laughs> I don't usually ask this question either, but I figured it's you. <laughs> Um, I'll tell you mine and it's not even a joke. It's just something that happened yesterday. (laughs) Okay. Um, my mom came over and was helping me clean out my closet, which has been a catch all for approximately 4.2 years. And, um, so we were, we took everything out and then we were separating it all into piles. 
And she goes, this is the I think you want it, but I don't know where to put it pile. <laughs> and I said, that's what she said. <laughs> and she died. No, that's what he said. See, I totally ruined the joke. I was trying to tell it as a joke rather than a memory. <laughs> and I quit. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I figured that it it's a heavy conversation. We'll end it with a laugh. And <laughs> yeah. And um, my last question is actually a question I ask everyone at the end of every episode. And that is, if you had one piece of advice that you could give to the world, what would it be? That's a good one. I guess if I had one piece of advice to give to the whole world, uh, the majority of them wouldn't listen to me um for so many reasons someone told me uh recently on my own page that has thirty thousand followers on it he said i've never heard of you of you before and you've got very brightly colored hair i was like yes <laughs> not sure what that has to do with anything um you know so i i'm i'm made you know, I, I think being non-binary and on the internet and a bit loud, uh, I'm, I'm frequently reminded of all the people who don't vibe with me. Um, <laughs> but for those who do, I guess you know, th th there are so many kind of gurus and whatnot on the internet who are like, you can have ever anything that you want or you could be a millionaire. And I'm like, I mean, that's technically possibly true. Um, so I don't want to spin anything that's that ridiculous and kind of asinine. But I think what I would say is that in terms of your mental health, your healing, your relationships, if you're not happy with things the way that they are or it's it's too hard, I, I'm fairly confident there's something you can do about it to at least push the needle. So... You know, you you may have considerations there that are uh, really tough. You know, I've got friends with with things like borderline personality disorder, um, and some of them are, are fighting really hard, really really hard. A lot of them have been in therapy for years and, and tried all sorts of different things, and they're better than they were, but they're still still really struggling. But I also know, you know, other borderline folks who've completely recovered and no longer meet the criteria for borderline personality disorder. Um, mm. equally my, uh, goddaughter who, who had it, uh, passed away in 2020. She'd made many attempts on her own life and, uh, finally succeeded. And, you know, so I I'm aware that there's a spectrum and that for some people, um, for a few people that, that healing is just not possible and, and life is possibly not going to get better for them. But I actually think they're in, they're, they're very much in the minor minority, so I think that if you do want more in, in whatever aspect of your life that is, I think it's possible. Most of the time, I think it's possible. And so just, I guess, don't give up. It might mean that, you know, you're still in debt by the end of the year. But actually, if you got serious about how you're going to make stuff happen and really try to explore those options and those solutions around your mental health or whatever it is it, it can happen I didn't pay for my trauma treatment I did a professional swap so at a time when I had no money I still made it happen mm. yeah so just I guess you know if, if there's part of your life that's just not working for you and particularly around your mental health or whatever it is like just keep going is I just want to end with this thought that any time in my whole life that I've had a dark moment I believe in reincarnation by the way any time that I've had a dark moment I have this first of all there's this sense in, in me of like but you're not finished you don't know the answer to this yet like today is massively shit mm. but you're not done like there's still a sense of like there's more here to do and actually there's more possibility like yesterday is bad and the second thing that I tell myself is that if you tap out of life now 
you'll get up there, you'll go, but there was so much that I wanted to do. And then you'll have to come back. You'll have to put up with uh, more more uh, traumatised, uh, potentially, parents and, and, you know, growing up in a society that is going to take you years to undo all of that programming. You're going to have to go through potty training. You're going to have to spend at least the first year of your life, like, pro constantly shitting your pants. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to go through that again. I'm like, I've worked so hard to get this old already and to to have reach this part and got over all of the shit that I have that I don't want to go through it again I feel like life is kind of only just started to happen in the last couple of years since my trauma treatment and I'm working it out and I'm getting there so hopefully that's like a funny way to look at things if anyone's sort of feeling in a bit of a dark dark place um but yeah I, I think that for most people better is is still to come if you want it and if you're you can just dig deep occasionally and just keep going a little bit more beautiful thank you ladies and gentlemen harris eddie hill signing off until next time